Credits Rolled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of No Credits Rolled. For our fifth episode, I wanted to try something a little bit different. So for today, I interviewed my pal Joe about two of our favorite games. All right, so for today's review portion of the show, I actually brought a special guest. I thought episode five, hey, that's halfway to 10. So let's try to make it a special occasion. Uh, I brought on my friend, my pal, saver of human lives, Nurse Joe. How's it going, Joe? Hey, Sam. I'm very excited to be on your show. You sound excited. I listen to every episode. Yeah, you're one I of our number excited. one listeners. <laughs> yeah, every episode on the way to work lines up perfectly. Halfway there, halfway home. I appreciate that. Yeah, we do. A, we actually we have a call in line, which I will plug now. Uh, you can always call into the show at uh, that's 856-209-0713. You can call in and leave a message. Uh, and when I made the call in line, I had a sneaking suspicion of the first person that would utilize the call in line. Uh, and it was it was my my best friend, one of my best friends, Joe. Uh, and we'll play the audio here. Hey, Sam, this is Joe, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, I was listening to your last episode where you announced your call in line. Super exciting news. Um, great episode. Uh, you jumped in at that the end, talked about Battlefront 2, Battlefront 1 and 2. Um, they're going to be looking forward to playing some 10 year old games or something. I uh, just wanted to uh, um, tell you um, about that, uh, make you feel a little old. Those games are actually uh, 20 years old. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of existential dread there. Uh, have a good one. Huh? Keep making the episodes. Wish they came out more often. Highlight of my two weeks. See you, Sam. Thanks. We have two different games I wanted to cover, and we've I've been wanting to have you on for a while because we, we have a lot of games we want to discuss, and I decided, hey, we'll do a double feature today. Uh, so the first game we're going to cover today is Helldivers 2. I'm sure if you're online at all, you've probably seen clips of this game. It's sweeping the internet, sweeping the gaming community, uh, and after much convincing, I was able to get Joe to buy it. Uh, so, Joe, what are your what are your top level thoughts on Helldivers Two? No, Helldivers Two is awesome. It's a lot of fun. Definitely a game you want to play with your friends, which is why it, you uh, had to try so hard to convince us to get it. Um, Sam tends to get us to try to convince us to get a lot of games, and we play them once and put them down, and they're so all it's good. Like, it's always like, oh, Sam trying to get us another game. Okay. <laughs> they're not all good and then this one you know what screw it I've got, I've got my nurse money now and so i bought the game made a couple of rounds and was hooked pretty fast i love uh sci-fi media and stuff and then the starship troopers element is just so good barely making it out of a mission is just such a great feeling yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree. I think that if you like Star, uh, Starship Troopers, this is basically a Starship Troopers game, but they couldn't get the license. So I think for off the bat, if you have any interest in that movie or that kind of tone, that like um, mocking uh, like military industrial complex stuff, I think you should definitely check it out. Uh, just some quick facts about it. It's from Arrowhead Game Studios. It's published by Sony Interactive, so it is a uh, PlayStation exclusive. I don't know if it's on PC. But it's definitely on PlayStation if you want to check it out. Uh, it is... I think it's on PC. I think Patrick was my brother was looking to get it. Okay. Yeah, because uh, Sony's been branched more into the PC realm as well. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest things, like you said, it's this is definitely a multiplayer shooter first, you know, off the top. Uh, it's way more fun with friends. I've tried playing it by myself, uh, and I kind of, you know, it's it's not anywhere near as fun. I don't know if you've tried you've tried solo, right? Do you have the same experience or Oh definitely. It's worth just being able to communicate and yell and shout at your friends <laughs> and bark, pretend orders. It makes it more fun. But you, sometimes you get a random that's just hilarious too. I don't talk in voice chat, but sometimes you start a mission before you even launch the pod, you get three level fifties ready to carry you to victory, which is fun too. Yeah, you mentioned uh hearing getting that voice yeah. chat. One of the first games that Joe and I played uh, we had this Scottish guy, and I think he thought the game was real life. Uh, he was very into it, uh, <laughs> and it really made one of like my first multiplayer experience in the game uh, pretty special because the guy like narrated everything we did. I don't know. Uh, it was it was something else, <laughs> and I was like, okay, this this was what makes this game different. Um, that that like communal aspect of it, which is incorporated in the gameplay too, because when you're doing these different missions. It might seem like it's just the same, you know, five or ten types of quests, but 
it's all cumulative with the whole player base that you're liberating these planets and the world is kind of changing as you go. It's a really unique way of approaching that live service genre that we so often see with games like Destiny where it can get kind of stale and you don't really feel like you're part of a big group, but in Helldivers, you really do. Especially with um, community missions like that. There's all kinds of like memes and stuff now about like Malevolent Creek where the Helldivers got destroyed in the by the bots because they were everyone's going all fighting the easier bugs and the things happen in that world map that affect the gameplay like you just liberate a planet and that's how they when they released the mechs was after we liberated the planet that was in the lore of, in charge of making the mechs oh really i didn't know that oh yeah 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 i gotta read up like lore. for honor where you should you should it's it's very funny like all the major orders have like a reason for them Oh really? Wow. Well there you go. You learn something new every day, folks. The um the map reminds me of like For Honor where there's like the war going on. Oh you yeah. Taken and yeah, that's a good comparison. Stuff, but instead of against each other, you're all working together. You mentioned with the the creek I that was before my time with the game, so I missed out on those memes. But it does speak to one of the things about the game that I love so much, and I think you mentioned it at the top, uh the intensity of it. Right? I feel like almost every mission, I mean, we've gotten better at the game as we've played, but if you bump up your difficulty to hard or challenging, every mission has something new and something intense about it that keeps the gameplay feeling fresh. Uh, it's not necessarily realistic, but it's very easy to get caught up in the moment of what you're doing. Yeah, like diving away from an explosion. Um, changing your loadout is a big thing that I enjoy about the game is when you're going to a different planet, or you're going to fight the bot instead of the bugs. Like your loadout would be different. Like a flamethrower is great for the bugs, but not so much for the bots. Or um, the impact grenade can't destroy the uh, bot creation facilities, but it can destroy the bug holes. Or the stratagems you call in even can make a big difference in whether you survive or not. Yeah, and there's the discussion of like the meta of the game. It is a PvE shooter. You're not fighting other players. So there, when the first initial patch came well, out, they nerfed a lot of the good guns. Uh, well, you are fighting your teammates when you blow them up by accident, but that's really easy. Um <laughs> the the initial patch when it came out nerfed a lot of the good guns and there was the uproar in the fan base because I think it it, it opens up a wider discussion of the like the gamer culture, which I cringe saying that, but like everyone's chasing the meta for so many multiplayer shooters. Like a, I think Warzone is a big reason for it, but in Helldivers, it's really oh, yeah. not about that. It's a it it's about what best suits the mission and sometimes you just want to have fun too and use a weapon that you enjoy just because it's cool. Yeah, I have not had good experience uh, with the like that shoulder mounted laser as far as killing the enemies goes. But it man, it feels cool to have a shoulder mounted laser gun that <laughs> kills that doesn't overheat. And then on cold planets, always run that. I'm always running that laser gun on the cold planets because it doesn't overheat as fast. Like little elements like that that they didn't, they would have been just as good a game without it. But it really does add it. Yeah, and I, I say this it. I say this a lot when I review games for this show. Uh, I think above all else, the game is a ton of fun, right? Like I, we did, um, we I tried getting everybody into Payday too, and in that game, you're doing the same missions over and over again too, or even a Destiny as well, you're doing the same missions over and over again. But there's a little bit extra sauce in Hell Divers too that makes the fact that you're doing the same things over and over again enjoyable, and you don't really notice, you don't really get that fatigue. Uh, and I think a lot of that just comes down to the gameplay and the the intensity of it, and how every every time you do a mission, there's some X factor that kind of makes you like it makes it feel different even though the objective might be the same and that's like the best way to say it because it is just fun like i can't remember the last game we, we played together that was just fun it's not for us you know you play apex and you get dunked on it's frustrating yeah it's that there's not the uh the human element where you get dunked on and then someone teabags you and like calls you a loser in chat <laughs> or something like that like it it feels like an actual Especially if you do the robot missions, and I think I've got some gameplay footage. Maybe we'll put that in the video version if I if I'm not lazy. But it's it feels like you're fighting, like I don't know. Maybe it's the AI design of it, the bugs and the robots. There's enough AI there to make them feel just smart enough that you feel cool taking them out. You know, it's not they're not like super dumb. And you know, technically this is a double A game, so there are bugs and glitches. Bugs is in you know not the crawly bugs, but. Uh, performance glitches uh, and that can take you out of it a little bit but also that jank is kind of fun sometimes like yesterday at the time of recording we were playing part of the charm yeah we were we were playing and we had um we had a couple robots 
get stuck in some rocks and they couldn't move, and, but they could still shoot us. And then we were calling in stratagems and one is a big laser that locks on. Well, the laser locks onto the robots, but because they're in the rock, the laser is just shooting this rock for the entire time it's active and doesn't really do anything. Uh, and, you know, obviously that it's not effective, but it was funny. And again, it goes back to the game being fun. Or how about that bug we had where you were trying to swim and you died, but you didn't, you stemmed in the water, so you didn't really die, but you couldn't control it. So I had to run across the map and um, shoot him in the brain. Yeah, yeah. I basically put myself in a cryo sleep uh, that allowed me to not, I was between life and death, <laughs> but I wouldn't respawn. Uh, so yeah, Joe <laughs> had to come back and then free me from my eternal sleep. Uh, and I was able to come back. And there are there are some bugs that I do find annoying. Again, bugs and glitches. Uh, like every time I've been playing recently, my loadout gets reset to like the default weapons, which is super annoying. Uh, even though you can change it before you go out, it's like, I don't know. It's It just bothers me. Um, that's really the only major thing I feel like. And even then, they're they're doing little patches pretty, pretty frequently now. Um, now that they have the servers under control because the game just blew up in popularity so quickly. Now they can actually work on refining it instead of just making it playable. Yeah, that's definitely a frustrating one. I'm trying to get in the habit of um, re- resetting my loadout before I drop out. It resets your emotes too, so I go to hug you and puts <laughs> up the little hell diver salute. Totally. What the heck? Yeah, I think uh, one something I'm really looking forward to, and we've already seen it with the addition of the bots, because when the game initially launched, it was just the... the uh, the bugs you were fighting. I'm excited to see where this game goes next. You know what they add. We already saw that where they added the mechs and that was a ton of fun. And now that's behind a strategy you have to unlock, but it was almost like a free trial when it first came out. So I really think they, the folks behind this game have a really good grasp on what the fans want and what makes, what continues to make the game fun and different with gameplay elements. So I'm really excited to see, you know, new planets. I was, I don't know why I was in bed last night thinking about it. And I was like, what if they had a jungle planet and there's like Venus flytraps that you have to fight or like some sort of wildlife that is introduced or something like that. Like a new, new environments, um, new enemy types. Like I, I really do see the potential here. And I think uh, the folks over at Arrowhead do too, because of how popular the game is. I didn't play Helldivers one. I don't know about you, but I know there are other factions in that that could come into play. I played it very briefly. Uh, Cause it was, I think it was free. It was like one of the first PS plus games that was free. I feel like, uh, so I did play it a little bit. It was top down and it was more of like a twin stick shooter. Definitely not any, this is like the, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. What was that game called? Risk of rain. I think it was a similar transition where the first game was like a 2d, almost like a Terraria kind of thing. And then the second game, they went full third person, um, 3D shooter type, and it's like a big uh, step up like that, and that's kind of what happened with Helldivers too here as well. And I think overall the production and the budget is significantly higher than the first game, and that definitely shows uh, in a lot of the the uh, gameplay and that initial cutscene that looks like a deep fake. <laughs> like the guy, it's in the trailers too for the game. It's like that Uncanny Valley kind of video. Yeah, that which is another thing I think resets every um. Every time I do the game, every time I load the game, I got that cussing you can act skip. I know that that's great the first time though. It's very funny. And it sets the tone perfectly for the game. And like if you're on your ship, you there's like their version of old spice ads that play. The humor is very well done. Every mission you go into, sometimes it's a helpful gameplay tip at the bottom of your screen. Other times it's like a total joke that is, you know, like just just there to make you laugh. And it's it's rare that a game makes me laugh anymore, by the way. I feel like Borderlands, like completely killed my humor when it comes to games like nothing makes me laugh uh in video games because that game was like so aggressive with its humor uh but this game i think pretty consistently is very funny yeah i'm trying to think of any uh, of any of those um what are they called the bottom like the tips tips? yeah well there was the one we had yesterday where it was like the best way to uh demonstrate capitalism is to buy super credits which is the real currency in the game that's the premium currency (laughs) Speaking of that premium currency, you can get that for for free in the, by playing the game. That is true. That's a huge plus. Yeah. So the way they do your upgrades, they have they're basically like little battle passes, but there is a free one initially, and then you can get you can earn the in game currency to buy the premium battle pass, which gives you some of the weapons are locked to that premium tier, and some of them are just modified version of guns you can unlock normally that are just stronger. Um, but yeah, that is a huge plus. And again, it goes back to that. It's it's a PVE game. You don't have to worry about it being straight up pay to win where, uh, well, Timmy paid $100 and he just has the best blueprint for Call of Duty and he can just dominate me. You can earn the credits in the game and <laughs> spend that on um, 
whether that be armor or I think it, is it just armor in the in the shop for that currency, and then you can otherwise you buy the battle pass. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to look like a Destiny character, you can do that, or you can buy the battle pass, get some weapons and armor <laughs> in there too. I'm saving up to get the one just for the uh, the revolver. Oh yeah, yeah. I was I spent more money than I needed to when I bought it, as is my way, and I was able to get the revolver initially, and it was very cool. So. Uh, but yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say about Helldivers 2. It's a ton of fun, especially if you've got friends to play with. Uh, actually, that's a question for you, Joe. If you don't, say you can only play this game solo, would you recommend purchasing it? That is a good question. I definitely would not have if not for you being like, oh, you got to play this game in case you came out. Because um, I have great taste. Would, would In this uh, hypothetical scenario, well, you, 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 your great taste is just to... A shotgun spread. It's like a buffet of of everything. Yeah, and like, but like a buffet is not like <laughs> gourmet. It's not like good taste. In this hypothetical hypothetical scenario, are randos joining me? Sure. Yeah, we can. I mean, I personally wouldn't use voice chat because I don't like to talk to strangers me. on the internet. Uh, but yeah, we can say you're 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 talking to people. And yeah, I would I would recommend it then. Maybe you can make a friend. Why would I ever want to do that? <laughs> and the, the chaos ended from that. <laughs> uh yeah you know honestly i think that's a good point it reminds me of when among us first came out before all the children got a hold of it and you would play among us with strangers <laughs> and like you'd forge these relationships just in the moment well i love making little friends in, in games that, without talking to them um, <laughs> as as you know yeah that's true joe joe is like the the diplomat or the ambassador whenever we go online with anyone and then uh maybe we'll have kareem on at some point shout out kareem uh, he's our other friend in the group. We, Kareem and I typically try to immediately destroy those relationships as quickly as possible for amusement. <laughs> Much to my dismay. <laughs> uh, but, he's definitely off topic and you can, can definitely cut it out if you want, but you're playing with uh, an Apex and Kareem and I, I, I started crouching at the last two enemies, both took all our armor off. We were going to go fist it to cuff it out. Then boom, boom, wingman, wingman. Kareem, <laughs> I got him. Free win. I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's pretty indicative. You know, a win's a win. All right. But that's everything I think we've got for Helldivers 2. Was there anything else you wanted to mention about Helldivers before we move on? I don't think so. I think we, we pretty much touched on all the all the, the highlights of it. All right. We're back on No Credits Roll talking with my pal Joe uh, I've mentioned my friends before in this podcast. Joe's one of them. We just got done talking about Helldivers 2, and now we're going to talk about another one of our favorite games from this year. Another game, just saying, my batting average, pretty great. Another game that I talked Joe into buying that he enjoyed, and that's Baldur's Gate 3. Um, I've talked about it on shows before. I think I talked about it on this show. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is the best game ever, uh, <laughs> in my humble opinion. Uh, it easily, for me, was game of the year last year, uh, and I think it's a truly revolutionary game. Uh, but Joe, what are your thoughts on it just off the top? It really might be the best game of all time. As an, an avid D&D player, less avid nowadays, um, it definitely scratched that that itch. It, it, I don't even know it was running for game of the year, but that was an e- easy slam dunk. I've only had one really solid playthrough. I'm giving a little break before I get back in there. So uh, sorry for your, your podcast namesake, but I have rolled credits. It's okay. You're a guest. <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. Every character has something something about them that makes them interesting. Every spell looks cool, sounds cool. The the story can go so many different ways. It's hard to even talk about the story because so many different things can happen. Yeah, we'll try to keep it like middle of the road kind of spoilers. You know, nothing crazy. Maybe you know nothing past Act One, just in case. You know, maybe this convinces someone to go buy it, which I do recommend. If you even have a passing interest in RPGs and fantasy and D and D in um, multi-layered narrative stories that can go multiple different directions, I highly recommend you check it out. Unfortunately, it's probably not going to go on sale anytime soon because it won a bajillion awards. But hey, go support Larian because it made him took him like ten years to make this game. So the only reason I didn't play this game sooner was because Sam made me buy um, Diablo Four, which was 
mid at best. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll we'll do a whole other episode on Diablo Four. We'll do a whole five minute episode on Diablo Four. Uh, haven't touched that since we played it last. So, yeah, I don't think it's even installed anymore, which is such a shame for seventy dollars or however much it was. Yeah, we're not getting that money back. But hey, we do have a Patreon, and if you subscribe to the Patreon, I will give Joe his cut of Diablo if you give me seventy dollars. That's a promise right here live on the no please, World. please, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, but anyway, back to Baldur's Gate three. Uh, I just did some quick notes here before the show because I wanted to have a little bit of an outline. Uh, it really makes you, it lets you explore things any way you want. And we talk about this a lot in games of do my choices really matter, right? Is it going to end up being the same thing no matter what I do? And I think one of the ways that Baldur's Gate shines the most is in those choices where in even like the most minor decision, the most minor side quest can come back later in the game. Uh, and at a moment you are definitely not expecting. And it's, it's those kind of things that makes it feel really special. It makes the world feel like it's constantly evolving and changing along with your character and your party. The way everything can happen differently between playthroughs, like if a character happens to die or you don't run, happen to just don't run into them, you can miss out or gain stories and outcomes later that you wouldn't have ever known if you had done it the right in quotes right way yeah my dad he, he i think he said he's done 12 playthroughs now and he's still is ex- like every time he does a new playthrough he experiences something new uh and i really think that there are very few other games like that where and and that's kind of why i haven't rolled credits on this yet is because i know that i'm going to want to do more playthroughs so it's like well i could just play this game till the end of time so i'm not really in a rush you know and it's such a like finality thing when you finish that the game like you you there's no like it's it's over you're, you don't see those npcs anymore you don't see your character anymore the game ends and that's something that a lot of games i feel like don't have anymore where after the game ends oh you're just going to go back in the open world anyway and you can go and do little side quests and stuff but in this like if you miss a side quest you miss a side quest you get it next time and that's cool. another reason it's taking me so long to get through it is because i'm like I'm like combing every inch of every map to make sure I don't miss anything. I'm still missing things and I don't know how to complete the quest. But at this point, I'm like, okay, well, we got to rush the story along. Um, It reminds me a lot of Mass Effect, the Mass Effect trilogy, which I don't think you played those games. No, I'm not familiar. So the Mass Effect games, it's not the same gameplay. It's like a third person shooter. But in terms of these three games build up these relationships with your party. And then in the third game, decisions you've made in the first game can alter the story now it's not as like it's not as open as Baldur's Gate 3 like I'm pretty sure Mass Effect the trilogy still has like the same three endings no matter what you do but it's that sense of the illusion of making a difference in Mass Effect's case where your party and your allies come back at the end Um, except Baldur's Gate 3 does that for real um, because there's a lot more allies and there's a lot more ways you can make those allies to come in for the for the end of the game again no spoilers but it's pretty obvious that this is all building to something towards the end. Oh, absolutely. I, I cannot wait for you to do that final fight so we can talk about that. We should do a whole episode. We could do a whole episode on... We'll do a spoiler spoilers cast. Spoilers for, yeah. for Baldur's Gate and just talk about how our, our games were different because I know just from talking about what we have done so far, we've kind of hit very different endings. Yeah, that'd be, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll do that as like a bonus episode if I finish this within a reasonable amount of time. Of course, we'll have to we'll have to make a whole new show called Credits Rolled uh, and redo all the branding, but we'll see. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, deals, another thing I want to hit is the voice acting in the game. Uh, it's incredible, uh, at least in the main cast. Uh, some of the NPCs are, you know, they're NPCs. So what are you gonna do? But now I know uh, Neil Newborn, I believe, is the guy's name. He got the nomination and he won the Game Award for Best Performance. Now, unfortunately, in my main playthrough, Asterion is not alive. So I didn't really get to experience uh, Neil's performance, but my favorite character is Carlac, uh, and her performance is spectacular. I I I, sh- I should look up the actress's name. I should give these people the credit they deserve. Um, but her performance is incredible. All of your companions are are just the best. Um, but yeah, Joe, who's who's your favorite companion? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm outing my little myself a little bit. I really really enjoyed Shadowheart's story. Every time I've play, play, gotten to play D and D in a tabletop sense, it's been years since <laughs> I haven't been 
the forever DM, but I, I love clerics. I love playing as a cleric. I liked her that she was like not evil, but she was a cleric of one of the less. She's a, a cleric of Shar, which is like darkness, shadows, and secrets. Like they're not a good person, but that you find out why she's this follower. You find out you get a, you just get a lot of stuff for her character in Act Two that I think really makes her shine as a character. You like go from lo- liking her to hating her to then liking her again or falling in love with her. Yeah. Um, Carlac again definitely shines though. Um, it, yeah. I hope you get the same ending for her as I did. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, you alluded that uh, my choices may not affect that. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, really quickly, I have the cast list pulled up here. Uh, I totally mispronounced Neil's name. It's Neil New Bond, not Neil Newborn. Sorry. Uh, Jennifer English is Shadowheart. Uh, uh, De- Devorah Wilde is Lysel. Uh, Theo Solomon is Will. Uh, Tim Downey is Gale. Samantha Bayard is Carlac. Matthew Mercer is in the game as a character that might be a spoiler, so I'm not going to reveal that. He's another one of the companions you meet, though. Uh, Tracy Wiles is Jahira, who also does a really good job. Uh, in particular, I wanted to shout her out. And there's, there's a bunch of other characters, but those are like the main... I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting somebody, but those are like a lot of the main cast that you meet. There's also famous people in the game. Did you know Jason Isaacs is one of the three villains from the second act? The one with black hair? that Whose name I don't want to say? No, I didn't. Yeah, and then of course, J.K. Simmons is the first of those three. Oh, yeah. that you and he's great. You'll, I mean, that's... He's that's, phenomenal. Yeah, he's awesome. And it's kind of a shame he's not in the game more, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's Jason Isaacs. How about that? I do remember in your other episode where you mentioned that where you're talking about the Game Awards, you had said like, oh, I don't see how Neil Newbin could win the award. That's the only one you didn't like give Baldur's Gate the green light for. Oh, really? Well, I was clearly wrong. Uh, <laughs> you, you've heard it here first, folks. Uh, uh, probably because you didn't have a... The character that was nominated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that definitely was was definitely wrong on my part. I also, like, I remember because it was... Um, I don't remember the woman's name, but the woman from Alan Wake 2, which I hadn't played, I really only knew Yuri from Spider-Man. So and I was just like showing my bias on my sleeve the whole time for that. Uh, but yeah, the voice acting is 10 out of 10. There's also a narrator who does a fantastic job. That's Amelia Tyler. Uh, and I believe she streams on Twitch as well. And she does like the narrator voice or she was for a while with the game. Um, but there's moments in the game where like the narrator voice will turn on you and isn't necessarily the narrator but it's like your mind being manipulated and she tweaks the performance there it's very very cool um so yeah this is definitely a game you want to listen to uh and speaking of listening to it as well you want to listen to it for the music which is also incredible uh there's a reoccurring sort of motif which is like the down by the river song and the way they remix that song and bring it back in subtle ways in big ways throughout the game is really really special and it reminds me of like halo when like the main halo theme when that kicks in it's like all right well this is this is like this like defines this game and i think that that song as well in Baldur's gate 3 it sort of is it goes hand in hand with my memories of the game as well yeah you're definitely missing a lot of subtlety if you're playing this game with your headphones off and netflix in the background and your kid crying (laughs) <laughs> or if you're listening to a podcast like No Credits Rolled, you know, you wouldn't want to distract yourself, but I will say you should turn off the yeah, podcast. you wouldn't want to distract yourself from the podcast. Well, yeah, you want, well, yeah, pa- pause the game, listen to the show, and then go play the game. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to touch on the yeah, music the, the podcast quick. is a lot shorter. <laughs> Extra short this week, maybe. But yeah, no, I just wanted to touch on the music as well, because that's also incredible. Essentially, every aspect of this game is incredible. I don't really think it misses in any regard. Um, now for me personally, I do think I, I had maybe like the buggiest playthrough of this game ever. I would still bugs. I still find bugs all the time where certain areas are just kind of busted. I've had big boss fights that are just kind of busted. I've had well multiple big boss fights now that just don't work. Um, but again, I think that must be a me thing. Cause I have not heard anybody else complain about that. I think I'm just unlucky. It sounds about right. <laughs> I never, I didn't run into any bugs like that. And I, you had issues all Kinds of issues with uh, Fallen Order or Star Wars Jedi Survivor, too. Yeah, everybody. Jedi Survivor was like a disaster on launch, though. But I did have issues with God of War Ragnarok that nobody else had either. So I think it's because I got my PS5 from Kohl's. Um, I just think it's cursed. Anyway, 
uh, yeah, the music is great. The voice acting is incredible. Uh, all the characters are memorable, whether you like them or you hate them. Some of the companions are more likable than others, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's not only one of the best RPGs I've ever played. I would say it's easily in my top five games of all time, maybe even my top three if I had to make a short list. What do you think? 100%. Definitely is so unique. It takes the lore, the lore of D&D, so it already has a background. A, it has a great story, no matter what way you take it. You, the, every class feels different. Every race, like, like having different dialogue depending on your race and your class, you got to pick that one. You're like, oh, I'm a paladin. I got to pick the paladin dialogue. It, it can give you advantages. It can give you disadvantage depending on the scenario. Uh, playing as like a, a cleric or a paladin in Act Two, that's all I'll say. What made you feel just the the ultimate power fantasy. Oh, yeah, I bet. I can't even imagine that. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. You mentioned the class dialogue. I'm a sucker for that. Anytime the what I've done in my character creator comes back in gameplay in that way, it's so sick. And even now, with my character being morally, morally questionable, uh, if a monk option comes up, I'm like, hey, man, just chill out, all right? Center yourself. It's fine. Even though I'm like, you know, I've done horrible things. Yeah, especially, I guess, when you're character's actions in their class don't exactly align <laughs> and the uh, easiest way to do that is with a monk for sure yeah the uh the character creator is i didn't write this down in the notes but the character creator you could spend like hours in i think if you really want to commit to it you it's it's one of the most impressive character creators i've seen and especially if you're a D fan because just scrolling over the different classes and there's like a little like demonstration animation for each class Right away, you're like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. And you mentioned it earlier when you're casting spells or using abilities. The way they show the the, the magic in particular, the way they translate D&D spells into gameplay is so cool if you're a D&D fan. Like there's Speak With Animals where when you cast the spell, you like cast it on your own mouth and then you can talk to animals or even just Firebolt or, or Ray of Frost. They say like Glacius and Ignis and it's so it's so cool. Uh, and it's it really never gets old. <laughs> even... Yes. Yeah, even, you know, however many hours I'm in, it, it still it still never gets old to cast that spell and to hear a character, like, do, like, their little power-up before they fire it. Um, even if you're not a fan of, of turn-based RPGs, I would still recommend checking this game out because I think the presentation really carries it, and I think it really makes it stand out from maybe another turn-based RPG you've played that didn't really hit for you. And it differs from other turn-based RPGs, I think, just by you having four or plus characters to control each in different initiatives so it's you're not waiting 20 minutes for all the enemies to take their turn you get a little chance to play in between yeah and it gives you a taste of the other classes too um i talked about this with my dad the other day talking about why carlac is my favorite character in the game i liked her initially because i in our Joe uh, and I's main D and D campaign, I was a barbarian. So when I got the barbarian character to be able to play as, it was like, oh, this feels right. This is like, I probably should have picked this from the bat. Um, <laughs> but I was saving to make my D and D character for my playthrough with Joe, which we ended up doing. But getting that character, and then later on, if like say you start with a character, say your character isn't a magic user, but you end up getting the wizard and the sorceress and the warlock, you get the. Uh, that gameplay flavor and you can change it up as you go, which I think is a really good idea because you're not just pigeonholed into your character, which a lot of other games tend to do where even in um, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which I was going to talk about, but we'll probably save that for next week. You can make your party leader Barrett, who has a gun or Tifa, who's more melee based, but you always, you're mainly playing as cloud for a lot of that game. And they've added things where you can, it lets you kind of branch off a little bit more. But with Baldur's Gate, I feel like each character feels so unique and you can level them however you want too, which is the other cool thing. Um, you can level them and you can swap out their spells or their abilities at will and you can really make them tailored to how you want to play. And that includes picking subclasses, which can totally change the character as well. So I think it's just another element of the story that you play is however you want to make it. There are big plot beats that you're going to hit no matter what, but I think there's such a level of individual customization and choice that not a whole lot of other games do. That's true. Gale, for example, one one of my favorite characters, he might be my second or third. Um, when you're designing his like wizard tree, you can like I picked him as a divination wizard. So he had portent rolls. He could change an enemy's hit to a one or a ally's save to a, a 20, depending on what he rolled. 
and that could come in really clutch. Like I've never played a wizard in D and D or in Baldur's Gate, so it was cool to have that that experience. You know, like oh, okay, I could totally have fun with this if I do another playthrough. Oh yeah, that was another thing. I don't I'd... get a bard. <laughs> would have been yeah, that was weird, fun. right? I, that is kind of strange. Uh, that's another thing I did want to hit though that I forgot to mention is that I th- I think Baldur's Gate makes the tabletop D and D a better game. I think it. I think it takes the mechanics of D&D and puts it in the game in so much of a more approachable way. Uh, you and I are big pen and paper fans when it comes to playing the tabletop D&D. But in Baldur's Gate, it puts all your skills and abilities on different wheels, like a GTA weapon wheel. And I think that that makes it so much easier to understand. That and combined with at the bottom of your screen, it shows you how many actions you have, how many bonus actions you have. If you have a special ability like a Barbarian's, the amount of rages that you can do. It shows it all very clearly and it makes it a lot easier to understand. Uh, and I think if you are hesitant to play the tabletop D&D, play Baldur's Gate first and then you will have a huge advantage going into the tabletop version. I was just going to say that, you know, the you there are some differences in rules and classes and stuff, but the main gameplay of your actions, your having dialogue, your bonus actions, free action. And movement you can all keep track of is is similar to tabletop. So it, it's kind of like a tutorial of sorts. Yeah, and I think it makes you better at playing D&D too because the biggest thing with D&D when you play the tabletop version is you get out of it what you put into it. And the more you think outside of the box and the more things you try in D&D, now obviously in Baldur's Gate you are restricted because it is a video game. It's not just going to make up something on the fly. But it does give you a ton of freedom that lets you think outside the box in any given scenario, whether that be in dialogue or combat. And I think if you bring those, um, those skills that you develop throughout Baldur's Gate into the tabletop game, you're going to be a better player and you're going to be a better DM. If you're crafting your stories and you're learning how these different threads can overlap and how to make interesting characters. I think there's a lot to learn as a DM and a player for D and D from just Baldur's Gate alone. Definitely. There's times in the game where you're like, I wonder if this will work. And it, totally does like it'll never work in any other game <laughs> if you put a bomb down in a certain spot like, yeah let's, screw it let's, let's give it a shot and then it works perfectly the only thing i think it lacks is every now and every now and then there's a time where like oh, why can't i just say this this would fix everything yep why can't i just explain myself this way yeah instead of the the set four or five dialogue options i think that uh that that ability and that opportunity to try and just see what happens is a lot of the reason why my character has gone down the path he's gone down because anytime i'm tempted with a unconventional option or twist i pretty much take it just because i want to see what happens and that's another thing i want to mention uh the save mechanic 10 out of 10 you can it's like two buttons to quick save and you can try (laughs) something because whether that be you know you want to like toss a grenade into a group of guys or you want to say some off the wall stuff in dialogue it's very easy to experiment and it's easier to do that when you're by yourself because the game does have a multiplayer component, which we didn't even touch on. But when you're by yourself, you can, ex- it's like having the time stone is how I described it. You can explore every possible option. Because there are times in dialogue where if you pick the wrong option, that's cl- usually it's pretty clearly the wrong option. And whoever you're talking to will just kill you outright. Right. Or if you fail a check and which it's like, well, very, now we have to fight. <laughs> which is very D and D like no takes these, like when the DM is sick of your crap and they, all right, no taking that back. Yes, but now you kill. you wield all the power so you can do it. But yeah, again, I, I cannot recommend the game enough. If, if, if you have a passing interest in it, any aspect of it, please go check it out. Uh, and like I said, it does have multiplayer, so you can, you can have your own D&D adventuring party. There is a little bit of jank involved with the multiplayer side of things, and it does kind of mess up the pacing if everyone's exploring everything at once. The game does its best to keep up, but <laughs> I think the game really shines in a single-player uh, playthrough. If you're playing multiplayer, definitely stick together if the best you can. Yeah, do not split Just the so party. No one misses out on any dialogue or anything. Yeah, it's number one rule D and D in general. <laughs> um, two people is probably the best because you each get two or four because two people you each get a companion. You can still get their stories and stuff, but three people you're missing. Um, you you get one companion, so you got to do like one thing at a time. Can slow things down, or especially if I like Shadowheart and you like Carlac, and we're both trying to get their respective stories and you got to take turns or I don't let you take a turn. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's definitely true. 
Uh, I think that's going to wrap up everything we have today. Joe, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with Baldur's Gate 3? I don't think so. Definitely looking forward to doing a Dark Urge uh, playthrough. And uh, I would love those golden dice from Honor Mode, but I don't know if I have that in me. Oh, yeah. Honor Mode is where you like can't. It's like permadeath, right? Yes, there's no quick saving, no reloading saves. That's so much pressure. I don't think I could do that personally. <laughs> yeah, a lot of pressure, but you get golden dice. <laughs> the dice. We all love golden dice. Well, that's going to wrap things up for episode five of No Credits Roll. Thanks so much to Joe, my pal, for coming on the show. Joe, did you have a good time? Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we do it again soon. It sure makes the time go by faster. I'll tell you what, it's tough to get up here and talk for however long I can by myself. I really enjoyed having a co-host today. Anytime. And thank you all at home for listening. I appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, you can always reach out to NoCreditsRoll at gmail.com. We will read them there. Uh, as we've demonstrated, there is a call in line as well. You can call in and leave us a voicemail at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713. And we just might play it on the air unless your name is Joe, and then we probably won't. Make sure to subscribe to No Credits Roll on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. I believe we're there. or even on Deezer, which I'd never heard of. Uh, there's also a Patreon you can check out if you're feeling generous. Every little bit helps. Uh, and yeah, that's going to do it for No Credits Rolled, Episode 5. I'll see you next time. Yeah.